we're going to be going over the basics of the OSI model, talk a little bit about IP subnetting, which we will get into further in a later video, basic network communication, internal to our LAN and WAN communication, and we're going to take a look at following the packet, what happens to information as it goes from one source to a particular destination. Let's go in and talk about that OSI model. OSI stands for Open Systems Interconnection. It's established in 1982 by the International Organization for Standardization. And they came up with a seven layer communication model. And basically, the seven layers are requirements for two machines to be able to communicate with each other, how to package the data, everything like that. In a TCP IP network, there is what's called the four layer TCP IP model. I've also heard it called the DOD model. And they break the seven layers up into four functional layers for each type of protocol that would be used. Layers five, six, and seven basically map to what would be called the application layer in the four layer model. The transport layer is still called the transport layer. The network layer is called the internet layer. And the bottom two layers are called the network interface or network access layers. Now, what happens is we have protocols written to carry out certain things. An application protocol, such as FTP or HTTP, would make sure that these three requirements are being met. Application, you've got to have some sort of application, functioning, presentation, everything's got to be in the appropriate format. Session, you must establish a session in communication before transferring the data. FTP or HTTP both make sure those three requirements are met. So there's one protocol making sure those three requirements are met. That protocol, that application protocol, is represented inside the packet by what is called a port number. So the port number identifies the application layer protocol. At the transport layer with IP, we have typically TCP or UDP. There is a number that tells us or that represents TCP or UDP in the packet. And that number is called a protocol number. Then between the network and the data link layer, and actually this is what the logical link control portion of the data link layer handles, it's called a service access point. And that puts the type field into a packet to tell the receiving device to use IP or IPX to open the packet, depending on what layer three protocol was used. So there's a service access point identifying the layer three protocol. So the layer three communication protocol is identified by the service access point. The layer four protocol, like TCP or UDP, is identified by the protocol number. And then the application layer protocol like FTP or HTTP is identified by a port number. What I want to do is take a look at what's going to happen to a packet as it goes from one place to another and see what happens with this OSI model and how it interacts with a packet while traveling through different devices. Let me bring up a slide. I've brought up a network diagram and what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at what it takes for computer A over here to transfer something or upload something to the FTP server in this subnet here. We have two local area networks separated by a wide area network connection. So what do we need for this computer to be able to communicate with this server? First thing we're going to need is addressing. And a very popular type of addressing would be IP addressing. So what IP addressing do we need? Now the first thing we need to know is what 
subnets or network addresses we're going to be falling under. And just for demonstration purposes, we'll say that this entire environment is network 20.0.0.0 with a slash 8 subnet mask. So what we need to do is we need to figure out how to address all these systems and have them all be a part of network 20.0.0.0. That's where the subnetting comes in. Every different broadcast domain, and we've got three of them. Here's one broadcast domain. Here's another broadcast domain, and probably a lot of broadcast domains within there, but anyway, we'll just consider this one subnet. And then we've got another subnet here. So we've got three subnets going on. Subnet one, subnet two, subnet three. So we need to chop network 20 up into three different subnets. To be able to do that, all I do is I start breaking everything down into binary. So I make sure I've got the first octet is 20. I don't need to break that into binary because that's not going to change. I can't change this number because if I do, I'm using somebody else's network. That's not good. And I'm going to leave the last octet just as zero. Uh, I can write out the rest of them. Don't be lazy like me. When you're doing subnetting, if you need to, break it into binary. So what I need to do is I need to section off part of the node portion of network 20 and make it part of the network portion. And I need enough binary spaces to be able to represent three different combinations of zeros and ones because I've got three subnets. If I have one binary space, I've got two possible combinations of zeros and ones. If I have two binary spaces, I've got four possible combinations of zeros and ones. That's a one one right there, not zero zero. So this is zero zero, zero one zero, zero one, and one one. Four different combinations of zeros and ones. Now that's fine, except standard subnetting says don't use all zeros and don't use all ones, even though technically I can. So what we're going to do is we're going to say we need three binary spaces to be safe, to give us enough different combinations of zeros and ones. What that does, each binary space with two different combinations gives us two times two times another two, eight total combinations of zeros and ones which is more than enough to get three subnets out of. And here are our combinations, 000, 001, 010, 011, 100, 101, 110, and let's write that up here, 111. This is quickly becoming a mess. So what I do is I extend my subnet mask out three places, and it fits nicely with that equation, two to the n, Minus 2 is you can't use all zeros, can't use all ones. This 2 says if I have one binary space, I have a total of two possible options. The n is the number of binary spaces. So what we're looking at is 2 to the 3 minus 2 is equal to 6, which is more than enough to get our three subnets out of. So by extending the subnet mask out three places, I have now designated these three bits that are normally part of the host portion as part of the network portion. And my first subnet is this right here. I just turn that bit on and I've got my first subnet. So subnet one is 20 dot, and what is this number? It is 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. 20 dot 32 dot 0 dot 0 for this subnet. This subnet right here would be one zero combination. It's going in increments of 32, 20.64.0.0. And then the last one would be one one right there, which would be 20.96.0.0. The new subnet mask would be we would be using is 255.224.0.0. That's the new subnet mask. Or you could also call it slash 11. 8, 9, 10, 11. You could also represent it as slash 11. 
So let me clean this slide up and set the subnets where they belong and then we'll go in and look at giving the IPs to the individual machines. I've gone in and filled in the IP addresses. So for the router interface here, which we'll say is Ethernet zero interface, we'll say this is router one, this is router two. Ethernet zero on router one has a dot one IP. Serial zero on router one also has a dot one IP, but it's part of the 20.64 subnet, not the 2032 subnet. So it's 20.3201, 20, 20, 20.6401. Serial zero on router two has a 20.6402 IP, and Ethernet zero on router two has a 20.96.0.1 IP address. I gave the computers .10.11 IP and over here .10 IP for the computer and then the server has a .99 IP address. Everybody's using the same subnet mask of 255.224.00. So that's the IP addressing taken care of. We need one other address for our computers to communicate and this address is very important inside of our network and that address is the MAC address. That's what our computers use to communicate at layer two of that OSI model. So everybody's gonna need a MAC address on the LAN side of our communications. For WAN connections, here's our WAN connection. Our router interfaces here are serial zero interfaces don't need MAC addresses. But the ethernet interface, as well as the computers, they all need MAC addresses. So I'm going to go in and instead of using a 12 hexadecimal character MAC address, I'm just going to use something like A2 for MAC addresses, just for demonstration purposes. Again, generally, well always, the MAC address is 12 hexadecimal characters, not two. I'm going to throw in some MAC addresses now. I've gone in and filled in the MAC addresses here. So all the MAC addresses are in red. And on the Ethernet interfaces, the Ethernet of the router, Ethernet interfaces on the computers, we have MAC addresses. We don't need them on the serial interfaces. Not necessary. So we've got our addressing, our MAC addresses, our IP addresses. Everything's set up. But we need a couple additional things to be functioning before this computer right here can talk to the server. The switch switches forward based on a MAC address. So the switch has what's called a forwarding table. And the switch uses that forwarding table to determine where to forward a packet. So the switch has three ports, port one, two, and three. And it has to associate MAC addresses with those ports in the forwarding table. The routers also have routing tables that need to be populated before they can determine what interface to send a packet out of. Hubs, they don't use any tables. They're strictly a layer one device. They simply take a signal in one port, send it out all other ports. So let me go in and populate these tables. We'll talk a little bit more about them and then we'll take a look at actually transferring data in relation to the OSI model. So let me populate these tables. Here are the tables filled out. Here is the forwarding table for the switch. How it gets filled out, let's say computer A right here, when it sends something and it enters in port one on the switch, this is port one, port two, port three, it enters in on port one on the switch, the switch looks at the header and looks at the source MAC address. And it goes, oh, computer with a MAC address of 9B, that packet came in on port 1, and that's where the source is, 9B. So that means if I have to send something to 9B, I better send it out of port 1. Computer B communicates with the switch, sends something, not to the switch, maybe to computer A. Again, switch looks at the source MAC address of C4. And goes, oh, if your source MAC address is C4, you came in on port 2, that must mean if I want to send something to you, I would go out of port 2. If the forwarding table was not populated and computer A sent something, what would happen is 
the switch would look at the destination MAC address. So, so let's say the source MAC address was 9B, destination MAC address was C4. So computer A is sending something to computer B. Checks the source MAC address 9B, puts it in the forwarding table, then looks at the destination MAC address, and if it's not in the forwarding table, the switch will flood the data out all other ports. So computer B and the router's Ethernet interface would receive the packet, except the router's Ethernet interface wouldn't open it because it would say, hey, C4, that's not me. I'm going to toss that in the junk mail. The routing tables, they need to be able to populate so the router can make a forwarding decision or a routing decision. If computer A is sending something to the server over here, the FTP server, the routing tables need to be populated. And if you look at the routing table, it shows the source or any destination subnet, not a source subnet, any destination subnet, 2032-6496. The router automatically knows about 20.32 subnet and then it's attached to the Ethernet interface. And the reason it knows that subnet's there is because we've configured an IP address of 20.32.01 on Ethernet 0 with the 255.224 subnet mask. The router does the math and goes, oh, that's subnet 2032. Let me put that in my routing table. Same thing with the .64 subnet. However, the router is not directly connected to the 20.96 subnet. So what happened was, router 2 over here sent his routing table to router 1. Router 1 looked at it and goes, oh, I've got 64, I don't need that from you. I've got 32, I don't need that from you. I don't have 96. That's interesting to me. What's your cost? This router has a cost of 0. Router 2 has a cost of 0 to get to the 96 subnet because it's directly connected. So he goes, oh, your cost is zero if we're using routing information protocol, which is a standard, easy-to-use uh, routing protocol. He goes, okay, your cost is zero. I'm going to add one to that. My cost will be one to get to subnet 20.96.0.0, and I will send it out of my serial zero interface. So that's how the routers populate these routing tables. They first take their directly connected routes, with costs of zero and put them in the routing table then pass the information along. The receiving routers add costs to the originating routers costs. So they figure out what their new cost will be since they have to send it to somebody else. So eventually the routing tables and the forwarding tables will need to be populated then communication can take place smoothly. So let me clean this up again and we'll watch what happens when computer A send something to the FTP server over here. Okay, I've brought up the OSI model, the seven layers, and I put them above every device so we can see what's going to happen as computer A sends something to this FTP server over here. So, let's take a look at this. I'm going to break these models down. We're going to use an FTP client application to upload a picture from computer A to the FTP server. So the first thing that's going to happen is the FTP protocol is assisted or makes sure that there is a client application. I used to use Qt FTP all the time. So Qt FTP could be the client. We're sending a JPEG. Whatever we're sending is going to be in some sort of format. It doesn't necessarily have to be formatted on the fly. And FTP will make sure we establish a session of communication with the destination. We type in username and password, all that, log on to the server, select our JPEG, and then we hit upload. Now, what happens is our picture gets broken up into a bunch of smaller pieces called segments. This is TCP works with FTP. So TCP would be doing this and what it's going to do is going to break our picture up into smaller pieces called segments. Each segment would need to get its own header information. Now part of that information is going to be the port number, the application that it came from. 
The other information will be how do we put it back together? Since we broke it apart here, TCP has to put the information in the header how to put it back together. This is part one, this is part two. Puts sequencing information on there like one of one, one or two of, or one of two, <laughs> two of two. So if the receiving machine only gets one of two and doesn't get two of two, it knows to ask for two of two. So it puts all that information on there and passes it down to the next layer. So each segment gets additional information on at layer three. And the additional information it gets is IP information. Let me clean up the slide and we'll look at the IP data that goes on. So I've cleaned up the slide. And again, we're using FTP. So in the TCP header, the source and destination port numbers get put on, as well as the sequencing, error handling, all that stuff. And then when it's done, it sends the packet down to layer three. At layer three, the first thing that gets put on is the protocol number saying, hey, TCP was used to package the information up to this point. So the TCP would be in there. Next thing that gets put on is this source and destination IP. There are a few other things that get put on in the IP header. But this is the main stuff we're worried about, just so we can see what's happening. So the protocol number says, hey, TCP was used. Back here is all the TCP stuff, which has source and destination port numbers for the applications, sequencing, all that stuff. Then you get the TCP information put on. Here's our data. And source destination IPs. So source IP would be 2032.0.10. Destination IP would be 2096.0.99. So it puts source and destination IP addresses in there. Once it's done with all the IP information, it sends it down to the next layer. Again, I'm going to clean up the slide and we'll look at layer two. Layer two is where the packet gets fully framed. After the IP information has been put on, it's called a packet. Now, this packet gets fully framed. Gets the trailer, which has a cyclical redundancy check on it, all that stuff, and a header. Now the first part of the header is this LLC portion right here that specifies the service access point and tells the receiving computer IP was used. That's this number right here. So there's a port number saying what source and destination application a protocol number specifying the lay layer 4 protocol to use, and a service access point or type field specifying the layer 3 protocol to use. This is very important when you get to the receiving machine so it knows what set of rules to use to open the information appropriately. After the LLC information gets put on there, like saying, hey, IP was used, source and destination MAC addresses get put on. Now this is very important. So let me clean up the slide again, and we're going to look closely at this source and destination MAC address. I've cleaned it up again, and I've made it a I <laughs> started typing everything out because my handwriting's not the best. So we've got FTP going here, TCP, IP. It's called a segment at layer 4 because it's broken up. A packet at layer 3 once it gets the IP information on there, and a frame once it gets the, tra the trailer and the header it's fully encapsulated and it's called a frame. And here would be all of our data. Now this last part of the header, the media access control portion of the header. LLC, remember, specifies this little service access point telling the receiving machine what protocol to use. The source and destination MAC address needs to be put on at this point right here. Now this is important. Source MAC address is 9B. It's coming from computer A with a MAC address of 9B. The destination MAC address, a lot of times people want to say 7D as a destination MAC address. But that's not what it's going to be. The destination MAC address is going to be MAC address B3 the gateway. How do we resolve MAC addresses? 
when our computer wants to get the MAC address of a destination, he sends out a broadcast message. A broadcast message will not pass through the router. So what happens when a computer recognizes that a destination IP address, such as 20.96.0.99, is not in the same subnet as 20.3200, he sends out an ARP request, but not for the destination machine. He sends out an ARP request for his default gateway address. So it's very important that you have the appropriate default gateway configured on computer A. The default gateway address should be 20.32.0.1. That's the difference between getting routed across a network here or local communication. If he was just communicating with computer B with a MAC address of C4, the ARP request would go out to computer B and not requesting the MAC address of the default gateway. So very important. So it gets the gateway's MAC address and sends this frame out, it's called a frame now, in bits across the wire. Goes in, hits the switch. The switch looks at the source MAC address, 9B, and goes, okay, that's still associated with port 1. It came in on port 1, that's good. Let me look at the destination MAC address. Oh, okay, that's B3. It needs to go out of port 3 here. So if you notice, the only information the switch reads is information at layer 2. It receives the bits at layer 1 and receives and looks at the data at layer 2. So a switch is considered a layer 2 device because it reads layer 2 information, source and destination MAC addresses. It does not get into the IP addressing or anything like that. It doesn't care about the IP addressing. It's just looking at the source and destination MAC address at layer 2. There are Multi-layer switches that will read layer 3 addresses and stuff, but a standard switching function is a layer 2 function because it reads the source and destination MAC address. So it hits the switch, goes up to layer 2 of the OSI model, and then the switch takes it back down to layer 1 and sends it out of the appropriate port in bits. Let's take a look at what happens when it hits the router. Again, I will clean up the slide. So as this information package hits the router, the router receives the package with bits at layer 1 and then looks at the layer 2 information. So here's the layer 2 information. It looks at the source MAC address 9B, destination MAC address B3 and goes, oh, that's me. What do you do with a package with your name on it? You check it out. So he strips off the layer 2 information and looks at the layer 3 packet. And what's he looking at? He's looking at IP addresses. And he says, oh, source IP 20, let me write this big, 20.32.0.10 is the source IP. And again, he's reading it out of the packet here. Destination IP is 20.96.0.99. Checks out to see if there's any access lists or anything like that, security things saying, hey, I can't do this. And then he goes, okay, this is the destination IP. Let me check that out. Let me compare that to the subnet mask and find out what the destination subnet is. And he goes, oh, that's 20.96.0.0. Let me check my routing table. So he checks his routing table. He goes, oh, I do have an entry for 20.96.0.0. That subnet is one hop away and he need to send it out of serial zero to get there. So he takes the layer three packet that's been stripped off of all the layer two data and sends it back down the OSI model. So he repackages it. So at layer two, he puts on the necessary layer two information to go across the WAN link. Instead of following ethernet set of rules, he might be following the PPP set of rules. So he repackages it at layer 2 and sends it out at layer 1 in the form of bits, electrical pulses. Goes in, hits the next router. Again, I'll clean up the slide and we'll take a look at what happens at this router number 2 over here. Router 2 here receives that package in bits at layer 1, 
goes up to layer two, checks out all the PPP information on there, and strips it off. So he can see the layer three packet. And again, what's he looking at? He's looking at the source and destination IP information. Source IP, 2032.01. Destination IP, 20, I'm sorry, 2032.010 was the source. Destination, 2096.0.99. And again, he compares this IP to the subnet mask and goes, okay, let me check to see if I have an entry in my routing table for subnet 2096.00. And he goes, oh, I do. Cool. It's directly attached to me on Ethernet 0, and it's got a cost of 0. So I need to repackage it at Ethernet 0 on the way out. So here's the IP packet. He sends it back down to Layer 2 again. Puts the Layer 2 information back on. He says, hey, Service Access Point, LLC, IP was used. Puts the trailer back on there. And in the header, he puts the source and destination MAC address. What's the source MAC address this time? It's coming from the router, so the source MAC address is A2. Destination MAC address is in the same subnet, so if he does not have the servers, the FTP servers MAC address, he'll do an ARP request and it says, hey, computer with an IP of 2096.0.99, I need your MAC address, I'm trying to send you something. Sends his MAC address over and goes, okay, destination MAC address is 7D. He's repackaged it at layer 2. And then he goes ahead and sends it out, the Ethernet 0 interface, in bits at layer 1. So very important to realize that the routers are stripping off layer 2 frames and forwarding the packet based on layer 3 IP addresses. So the router is considered a layer 3 device, while a switch is considered a layer 2 device. Once this information hits the hub, what's the hub do? The hub doesn't read any addressing. The hub simply takes the packet, the electrical pulses of bits, and sends them out all other interfaces. So this, the switch will send the bits out of this interface to the other hub, out of this interface to the server, and this hub will send it out of this interface to this computer. This computer looks at the destination frame goes, oh, that's not my MAC address. And then the server sees his MAC address. He receives the bits, looks at the source and destination MAC. Source MAC A2, destination 7D. He goes, oh, that's for me. What do you do when you get a package with your name on it? He starts stripping that information off. Let me clean up this slide and we'll look exactly what the server does when he receives the package. So I've cleaned up the slide and I've done a little drawing here. Obviously not by hand. <laughs> so as the server receives the information, the first thing he's looking at is part of this Mac sublayer of layer two here. Here's the Mac sublayer and then the LLC sublayer of the data link layer, and he's looking for his MAC address. 7D. Oh, that's me. Okay. Start stripping off the layer 2 data and gets ready to move it up the OSI model to layer 3. Now, in this package here at the LLC portion of the data link layer, there's that type field. This type field tells the computer whether to forward it to IP or to IPX. So it's an indicator as to what layer 3 protocol to use to open the package further. If it's an IP package and it uses IPX, it's not going to work. Again, devices or computers aren't capable of only one supporting one layer 3 protocol. They can support IP, IPX, there's NetBuoy, other types of protocols there. So he needs to know which one to use. That's what the LLC does. It says, hey, use IP to open up further because inside is an IP package. So he strips everything off, moves it up, checks out the IP packet, checks source destination IPs and goes, dot .99, oh, that's me. And then before he moves it up to layer four, as he strips off the 
layer 3 stuff, he needs to know, since it's IP, whether to use TCP or UDP at layer 4. Very important, there's multiple layer 4 protocols for him to use in association with IP. So he needs to know TCP or UDP. That's where this protocol number comes in handy. Again, that's part of the IP packet. It's the last part right there, that protocol number. And it says, hey, use TCP. That's the last thing stripped away before he sends it up to layer 4 of the OSI model. With TCP, he notices he has package 1 of 2. That's FTP right there. He notices he has package 1 of 2, so he gets 2 of 2. Looks at the instructions, how to put them back together. As he strips off the TCP information and puts the package back together, he needs to know what application layer protocol to send it to. And that's where this destination port number comes in handy. The computer looks at the destination port and goes, oh, that's got to go to my FTP program. So let me forward it to FTP. So that way, the com receiving computer knows what protocol path basically to use to open up this information. Puts it in an FTP program, FTP takes the JPEG, puts it in the FTP root, and then you can go in and open up your picture. So very important are these service access points, protocol numbers, and port numbers. This is actually what our firewalls, access list things scan for because that's the indicator as to what type of package it is. So very important is this OSI model in understanding the flow of data. Let's do a recap of what we've gone over. We've gone in and talked about the networking fundamentals. We went over the purpose of the OSI, the seven layers. We did a little preview of IP subnetting, what that does for us. We went over basic network communication, what we need, the addresses we need, and we actually followed a packet from source to destination and looked at the devices and what layer of the OSI model they referred to. Like a switch is a layer 2 device because it reads layer 2 addressing. A router is considered layer 3 because it reads layer 3 addressing. A hub is considered layer 1 because it doesn't read any addressing at all. It just takes that electrical signal and forwards it out of multiple other ports.